Um, it works. Okay. This close? Hey, 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 we all made it here today. Woo. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, First off, I'm going to hand it off to Katie. She's going to do some announcements. Yes, I am. All right, rules first. I'm about to crush some dreams, favorite part of my announcements, but uh, there is no sourcing or selling here at Psych Health Club. I know. I'm so sorry about it. We're trying to be a legitimate nonprofit here, so just doing our best. And that's all I have to say about that. Oh, yes. Okay, so we do have a membership option for all you lovely people. Um, we launched it in December. We already have about 60 members of the Health Club of Denver. Um, we want to make it really easy for you to become a member, so if you donate $1 a month, you can become a member. Um, we suggest like 15 but um, that money goes to our harm reduction project where we um, help people check their substances for free. We'll go meet at a sketchy park and uh, help you consume more safely. Yep. Um, we also donate some of that to other nonprofits. Um, and some of it just goes to managing the club. Um, like that, that projector was not free. You know, so to it, but um, so your money goes to yeah, running a second out club. Um, you get some fun perks like you get voting power in the organization. Um, you get access to members only meetings. Got some pretty good potlucks. So pretty solid chefs in this group. Um, we do um, unofficial hangouts. Um, they're just really low key, like you know doing. Fun stuff together. Um, we're trying to get together on like a camping trip this fall, you know, some other fun stuff. So, yeah, it's just a great way to um, get into community with others and meet some like minded people. So, you're invited. Um, if you want to become a member, go ahead and see us at the table back there and we'll get you set up. Oh, okay. We'll keep going. All right. So, on July 30th, I hope you all have heard. If you haven't, we're not doing our jobs right. But we are having a mindful marketplace. So there will be about 30 plus vendors there. Um, we're having a cake walk. Love it. Okay, sweet. Yeah, bring a cake or cupcakes. You walk on the cake? No, you don't walk on the cake. I mean, that sounds like kind of fun. So I'll give it to you. But um, no, you'll come on the cake, leave with the cake. Anyways, we're going to have. Um, tarot, we're going to have, uh, what else, just a bunch of fun stuff during the day that day. Some breakout sessions, we've got um, one of the speakers from the breakout sessions here tonight as well. So, um, yeah, some cool stuff. Sign up for it, mushroom class. And then, later that evening, uh, later that evening, at the same venue, we're having a warehouse party. Um, opening will be Copper Children at 8.30. It'll be a lot of fun. Um, and then it will progress into DJs throughout the night until 2.30. Um, there will also be tarot at the party, there will be harm reduction staff on site, um, other things to do, coloring contests, drawing contests, um, lots of fun stuff, and it's going to be a great time. The QR code, yes, there's going to be a coloring contest and a drawing contest. Um, if you're high, you're probably going to be extra good. So, um, tickets. Or the QR code for tickets to the warehouse party can be found on this back table, also on the little note cards if you got one. Um, and the marketplace during the day is free to attend, so come to one or both, and it will be a great time. Um, and then also, in addition to those things, um, we do have a table back here that has quite a lot of merch. There's Nate and Matthew for leaving. Um, also on that table is free fentanyl tests. 
even if you're not using any opiates, fentanyl tests are a really good thing to have. They're free, there's no reason. Everyone in this room shouldn't have one if you're using substances. Or if you have a friend or family member that's using them, please give them to them. Please, please, please. You know, it's really important. I can't emphasize that enough. And they're free. So to get on with our evening tonight, you may notice there's a few people um, recording. People in the crowd are not being recorded, only the people on the stage. Um, if you ask a question, your voice is probably going to be recorded, but you will not be. So, yes. Yes. You can ask him about it, too. If you have any concerns. If you have any questions or concerns about the camera stuff going on, just ask me. I'm Nick. Yes. All right. And so, um, more about tonight. What this night is, is it is an informative night. Melanie and Nicole are going to talk about Initiative 61. Um, it's an invitation for you to form personal opinions about this political movement. Tonight is not about bashing another psychedelic bill. It's not about roasting Melanie or Nicole. It's for you to be informed and make decisions yourself. Um, and so yes, Melanie and Nicole are here to present on 61. First, they're going to present a bit about the bill, um, talk a bit about who they are, and then afterwards, we're going to have space for questions. We do have to be out by nine, but there should be plenty of space for questions, and um, Melanie and Nicole will be staying a little bit after to help answer any questions as well. A lot of people in this room are also very informed on the bill, so you can meet other people in that work. Um, and without further ado, I will present, we have Melanie Rose Rogers, who worked in the projector, and also Nicole Forrester, who both of these people are co-proponents of 61. So here we go, if we can give them a round of applause. Good evening, everybody. Um, we're still, this is the initiative we're, we're putting up here. We don't have uh, copies for you, but it is, here and it's half a page and we're going to go through it chunk by chunk so we will get to um the initiative itself and yes and before we begin i'm just going to ask everybody to just get settled into where we're sitting we're going around and just take a couple breaths with me before we We've made it, we've arrived, we're here. Thank you all for showing up and for being here. Um, and we're just gonna take a couple deep breaths. Okay, through the nose, cover the mouth. We're gonna do this for five deep breaths, so four more. Through the nose, and out through the mouth. Okay, um, I also want to just express my dear gratitude and also um, definitely acknowledge the land that we're on and we are occupying the Yan, the Ute, the Cheyenne, the Arapaho, the Apache, and 40 other tribes that have walked through this land here. Um, to all of our ancestors above and below, um, just want to center in and express dear gratitude for the breath that we take and for this time that we have. Okay, um, I think we're gonna just give some background to, you know, why we're here and um, Nicole can walk us through that so you can understand a little bit what we're gonna cover today. Hi everyone, um, thank you Psychedelic Club for having us tonight to speak about Initiative 61. Um, to start, we're just gonna introduce ourselves um, and then kind of walk through how we came to be proponents for this initiative behind us. Um, we'll go through the initiative, it's less than a page long, so um, we can literally like show every piece of it. Um, tonight um, so that people can come to a clear understanding of what it contains and then um, Melanie and I will just kind of talk about um, 
common things that come up and, and things that we think you guys should know about what's going on in this space uh, in Colorado. I think a lot of people here have been paying pretty close attention and are um, pretty informed on the policy landscape around natural medicines in Colorado in 2022, so that's awesome. Um, we really want to spend a lot of the rest of the time um, answering questions and having dialogue with all of you. So. Um, I'm hoping that anybody here that came with a question has a chance to ask that question, has a chance to get that question answered. Um, so um, we do want to give a lot of time for questions and then, um, yeah. Um, yeah, and then I also want to acknowledge uh, Peter Cristoni, he's um, also part of Initiative 61. Uh, he has a very in-depth presentation um, and he unfortunately isn't with us tonight. I don't know how many people are here to see Peter specifically, uh, but just wanted to acknowledge him and he's done a lot of great work um, in, in examining actually both initiatives. He's just um, you know, a fellow concerned community advocate and he's done a lot of work um, looking at both initiatives, but we don't have that presentation today, but I do have a feeling we'll be announcing a Zoom or something for for people that really want to get to the meat and bones and comparison of both initiatives um, in the eyes of a concerned community advocate. So just want to give a shout out to Peter. He's not with us, but um, we really appreciate him and all of his work. And he did give that uh, presentation, I think, last night at the NOAC Society meeting in Boulder. They usually put those up on YouTube. Um, and if you're not familiar with the NOAC Society, they're a great nonprofit um, based out of Fort Collins, Denver. They do events here at the Mercury uh, monthly, I think on Thursdays, I don't know which one. Um, but definitely check the NOAC Society out uh, if you're not familiar with them. Um, cool. Okay, great. Yeah, I can go ahead and start. Um, so, I'm Melanie Rose Rogers. I am the advocate and activist, a community organizer. Um, I work in the nonprofit area and um, just want to give some, some background. I'm also the co-founder of Expunge Colorado. We are a Colorado nonprofit that provides uh, free access to record sealing. So that's helping impacted um, lives all throughout Colorado, those who have, um, have had impact with the law and have an eligible criminal case. Uh, we have our annual clinic happening um, October 15th for anyone that you may know that has uh, a record. Um, this is beyond just cannabis records as well, anything that's eligible um, in the state of Colorado. Um, I also do social justice work. I'm the interim executive director at Cannabis Impact Fund, a cannabis nonprofit dedicated to racial justice within and beyond the cannabis industry. I'm uh, deeply rooted in social justice, anti-racism, and um, here, you know, and excited. Um, one thing I'll ask is how many of you are familiar with Denver's um, Initiative 301? You know, this is, uh, how many of you worked on Initiative 301? Can you stand up, please? I want to, you know, just give a shout out to, to everybody who was part of that. Thank you. Thank you. I worked on it too. Thanks so much. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, when people ask how to kind of get here, what brings me to being a co-proponent, I really do love to give a shout out to the group in 2018 and 2019. Denver was the first city to decriminalize psilocybin mushrooms. Um, folks on the room that helped um, with that, I was a, a one of six petitioners. So that means my name was on um, the, every ballot if, if you signed it. So thanks again. It was a community grassroots effort. It was so exciting. Um, there was definitely, um, you know, we were united. This had never been done before. And here we were about to decriminalize psychedelics, psilocybin mushrooms being the first city ever. So shout out to that work. And, and we did that, you know, um, what's different a little bit between then and now is right now is, you know, that was grassroots. That was like, we didn't know if we were gonna get there. It was all volunteers. It was a very um, strappy sh shoestring budget, but we managed to do it. And so I definitely like to uh, give some background to um, that's kind of how, what got me here. And I'm also a, a a patient advocate. I've helped pass laws in the state of Colorado to expand medical cannabis access to include autism and any condition for which an opiate is prescribed. Um, I believe in natural healing. 
Um, yeah, that's a little bit about my background, who I am, and where I come from. And um, yeah, so just uh, really involved with the community work. Nicole, will you introduce yourself? Yeah, my name is Nicole Forrester. Um, I also work there on I-301, and that's how I kind of came to be um, active in this space. Um, outside of that, I have worked in the healthcare field for 10 years. Um, started off working as a pharmacy technician right out of high school, and then um, I went on to get a degree in speech language sciences and psychology. I've worked in behavioral health um, and in the um, speech pathology uh, scope of things. And I currently manage a psychotherapy clinic in downtown Boulder um, that is specifically focused on um, equity in the mental health space and expanding access to uh, people who have a hard time accessing mental health care. So um, people on Medicaid and people low income, we provide a really generous uh, sliding scale. Um, so I do um, a lot of work in the, in the mental health and just the healthcare space um, and have seen, you know, the strengths of that field as well as the weaknesses, um, specifically around just accessibility. Like, can't think how many times I have provided a service to somebody that I myself could not access. Um, and I think a lot of people that work in that space can understand that and, and um, definitely is how that space can be when we start talking about equity and accessibility. So when um, we move on to talking about psychedelics, I'm very passionate about how we can be having um, access conversations and equity conversations and bring that into this space. Um, I, yeah, the, the work that I do as an activist is um, all volunteer. It's all sort of a passion for me. Um, I guess, I, yeah, I've been doing this uh, activism work for, th for three er years now, and um, I've done that all as a volunteer. And I think from the perspective of like this work um, doesn't support me, I support it. Um, and that's the relationship I have with it. So it's it can be a lot of times. Um, I, um, oh, I'm also working locally on policy reform in Boulder County. I uh, started Decriminalize Nature Boulder County, incorporated it back in February of 2020 um, after working on I-301 um, along with people in the community that were like, we need to be doing this in Boulder. Um, and I've stayed really active in the national conversation around um, what local policy change is looking like at the grassroots level around plant medicines, you know, all over the nation. Um, sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, so I'm the... Uh, currently one of the co-directors of uh, Decriminalized Nature Boulder County, um, which is working to um, work directly with city council to decriminalize plant medicines um, and maybe even all drugs in Boulder um, as soon as we can. So um, exciting things are happening there. If you want to get involved locally, reach out about that. Um, we have been, um, pretty active doing that. Uh, another member of our team, Rumsey, is here tonight. So um, definitely talk to him or me if you want to get involved locally in Boulder. Um, and yeah, and I think kind of would be helpful if we just kind of walk through like what things have been like for us, like after I threw a one and, and that kind of thing. And yeah. Um, so after Initiative 301, um, I, I, I mean, I, my healing journey really began. I began, um, and you know, it was actually sitting at a NOAC society meeting, and then them, you know, telling me that psychedelics can um, bring up trauma sometimes when you least expect it. And um, it was that, and sitting with, you know, in in the audience, hearing that from a couple people, veterans sharing their stories, and I was like, wow, I really, uh, I got to reflect back to um, a very uh, 
kind of wild psychedelic trip that I had that it did expose um, some of that trauma. But once you have that awareness, then you can really then, you know, get to healing that. So that's what psychedelics really have done for me. And I've been um, enjoying psychedelics for since the year 2000 and um, but didn't really get to get in involved with the medicinal aspect, the therapeutic aspect, the spiritual aspect more so really, which started with the campaign, you know, when Denver decriminalized mushrooms and we were sitting and, in, in, you know, sharing stories and um, I've gone to a couple conferences. Um, so um, down in Pittsburgh and got to uh, really explore. Um, and that led me also to say with grandmother ayahuasca medicine, which was in October of 2019, which did tremendous for, for my own personal healing and um, for um, some buried wound trauma that I've had. And so uh, with that, I you know I feel very close to the medicine. I um, believe that yes, no one should go to jail for this medicine. And I definitely wanna, you know, have, you know, and, and take caution as to, you know, when when legalization, you know, happens and it eventually, you know, will happen. You know, I'm just very concerned in doing things, you know, with many diverse voices in the room. And, you know, I mentioned before that I come from the cannabis industry as a patient advocate. So I've watched, you know, I was around when there was medical cannabis, um, and before adult use amendment 64 here in colorado and so you know when you look at cannabis legalization um we can definitely learn from cannabis legalization as we you know um you know as a parallel story to how we want to legalize psychedelics you know the things that i definitely speak to is, is social equity you know if you look at who owns all the licenses who's sitting in jail you know, if you look at even veterans for access, the VA doesn't, you know, um, the VA still doesn't cover it. Medical insurance doesn't cover it. And it's still very costly for people to pay, you know, to, to skip their pharmaceuticals and go down the route of even using medical cannabis. So, um, you know, my lens is from, you know, a social justice, it's a, you know, social equity um, as to the kind of industry and the economic growth that we are going to create once we do legalize psychedelics. And I'm definitely just a voice for making sure that it is diverse, that it is inclusive, and that we, um, you know, and that it is affordable for anyone, you know, that doesn't fit in that box of, um, you know, um, any box, you know, gender, health, um, you know, that they can also just freely explore on their own, like we've been doing it for years, uh, indigenous cultures have been using these medicines for, for centuries. So um, that is kind of the lens that, you know, I I definitely come from when we talk about how we legalize. And I believe in decriminalization first. You know, we decriminalized here in Denver. That was 2019, 2020, COVID, 2021, and here we are in 2022. So for me, the way to organically grow is really to start with decriminalization, um, to provide equity, health, you know, freedom, sovereignty over our bodies before anyone, you know, dares to tell us how to choose our own relationship with nature. So that is a little bit um, of like my perspective, and um, yeah, but that's it. Yeah. Um, I, back in 2018, learned that um, Initiative 301 was... I just remembered something. All right. Oh. Yes, I do. Okay. Sorry about that. So and then in 2020, um, I and a few people in this room went to Washington, D.C. to help. It was like we were calling ourselves the A-team and help in that final push. Again, they were having in the middle of the pandemic, uh, getting people getting the enough, getting the required signatures they needed. So they called in the Denver team, about maybe five, eight of us went down to DC, and it was a, a really special time um, to be there, to have conversations. Um, so that's something I forgot to mention. But yeah, I went down to DC. And so, excuse me. Um, so for me, it's been about decriminalization from the very beginning. Nothing else has changed or faltered or been influenced, you know, and where I stand in anything. Um, and that brings us to fast forward, and Nicole can talk about. Cool. Um, yeah. So when I was 
like 15 or 16 years old, I started having um, these really intense pain episodes uh, behind my eye. And uh, it took about a year of daily excruciating pain um, for me to get a diagnosis. And I found out from a neurologist that I had a condition called cluster headaches, uh, which are it's a neurological disorder that um, is this really intense pain that's been studied to be actually the most painful uh, thing the body can experience, more painful than childbirth, more painful than a gunshot, more painful than um, you know things that can end your life. And actually one in five people with this disorder do attempt suicide. Um, and I just like always get brought to tears when I talk about it. So. I got to regroup, but um, I was diagnosed with that, and the pharmaceutical medicines available at that time uh, had like a 30% um, success rate with people who had tried them, and I started reading online that people were using psilocybin mushrooms to treat their cluster headaches, and they were calling themselves cluster busters, and... Um, I remember thinking like, I grew up in a family with like a lot of alcohol abuse and I didn't know too much about drugs. I didn't even smoke weed. Um, and I was very trusting of the medical system. And at age 16, I got addicted to opiates because that's what was prescribed to me for that condition, even though the research shows that that's just about the worst thing you can give to somebody that is having uh, neurological pain. Um, so I went through some years of that and then finally tried psilocybin when I was about 18 and I didn't have another episode of the cluster headaches for three years. So um, at that point I had become kind of more immersed in you know, the culture of substance use and I never really talked about it like from the lens of I'm treating a really severe neurological disorder. Um, like my, my use of psychedelics and psilocybin. Um, but I kind of knew in the back of my head, like one day, you know, policy change is gonna start happening around these medicines and um, I'll get involved and I'll play it safe and I'll advocate for a medical model for people with my disorder to access this because, you know, this is too cutting edge to be too radical and I, it's really interesting to reflect on just how much of my own understanding of the politics and of how much power I had to kind of uh, make change that I didn't think was possible um, when I first entered the space. So, you know, back in 2018, I found out about Initiative 301 and I came out of the psychedelic closet, as they say. I like publicly started talking about psychedelic use, um, and in the back of my head during all of that, I um, was thinking like, you know, I was like so, I learned so much from that campaign really ingraining into me why we have to decriminalize these medicines first. Like why the way I was thinking for kind of this medical model being the only way, um, wasn't actually what I really even believed. It was like what I thought had to happen in order for us to like kind of play it safe. Um, and so, yeah, I think just like the most interesting thing for me to reflect on is just like how easy it can be like in this space to just give away our power as people and as community to um, affect policy. Um, because my complete outlook on just like what policy change should look like has changed by just interacting with other people in this space who are advocating for decriminalization first. And when we say decriminalization first, we're meaning that um, any activity related to these medicines except for sale is no longer a crime. So you can grow these medicines, cultivate them, have your own relationship with them, share them with your friends, um, that kind of thing. And, and it's not a crime, which is different than um, legalizing something so that you can regulate it and tax it and create an industry around it. Um, I personally don't think that we're like in the time um, to 
push forward a legalization model uh, for several reasons. Uh, we've learned a lot from cannabis, just um, why putting that profiteering model uh, ahead of people's like individual rights to do things and making sure that people aren't going to be incarcerated and that type of thing um, needs to come first. Um, so I became you know, a really strong advocate for that decriminalized first um, stance and started following kind of nationally what was happening there. You know, we saw DC pass a decriminalized nature resolu resolution or initiative. Um, and then, you know, today, I think, you know, as of today, there's probably 15 cities in the United States that have now done the same thing on the local level. Um, and coming off of the I-301 campaign in Denver, I felt like it was very important that the local communities be directing what policy change would look like. So um, there was a, a group of people kind of in the space who were, you know, wide-eyed and ready to figure out how we could, you know, do this statewide as soon as possible. Um, but I had been warned that doing that would invite in a lot of big funding that had, you know, every interest to commercialize these medicines and uh, not necessarily have the um, the intention and the um, current use of community like in mind. So um, I think ideally, like that these policy changes should be happening at the local level. We have groups organized in Boulder, Fort Collins, Aspen, Colorado Springs, Durango, and some others across Colorado that are trying to work directly with their city officials on how this policy change should look. And I think it's really important that that happens before any statewide policy change happens. Um, so you might be wondering why we're campaigning statewide, um, if that's what I really believe. Um, when I found out that um, there was going to be a statewide initiative, that's the National Medicine Health Act, um, I was asked to sort of, you know, participate in that process. And um, throughout community meetings and town halls and meetings where we got to see the draft of the language. Um, I didn't feel aligned with it. Uh, it wasn't decriminalized first. Um, it had limits to possession, which were removed because we have strong community here that wanted to see that removed. Um, and a lot of just different things that I can get into if anybody has questions about, but um, yeah, just I didn't feel aligned with it, and that feeling that I had was also had by many others in our community. So I was asked to do something about it because I um, have been active in the Boulder space. Um, I was asked by a lot of people coming off of town halls that were being held and other events and being put on a committee that was, you know, responsible for creating policy reform that would be equitable um, and to try to convince the people behind the Natural Medicine Health Act to incorporate what the people at the grassroots level in Colorado were asking for. Um, and so started drafting this Initiative 61 and um, asked Melanie to be the co-proponent and we came up with this language by polling internally. So kind of to contrast the big polling that's done, you know, around the general public's understanding of this to craft, you know, policy language like a big organization would do. Um, we surveyed the affected people. So the people that were showing up to weigh in on this, to support it, to not support it, people like in our community and found that the things that were most important to people were making sure that there was decriminalization first, um, no regulation at this time, um, and it, you know making sure that there was a democratic process in, involved in any policy change that would happen. One of the biggest things that we have advocated against is creating closed task forces. So any 
sort of policy that's going to give power to a select amount of people to then tell the government, the regulatory agency, how policy change should look like. Um, we've advocated for open task forces, so something where there's going to be like no seated members, where all people affected by the policy are going to be informed that it's happening, um, and things like that, and um, pushed hard for that to change in the Natural Medicine Health Act, and it didn't. So there is a closed task force in the Natural Medicine Health Act would be an example of that. Um, and so those were really the big things that people felt, you know, consistently we were hearing that people wanted to see. Um, overall, though, it felt like it was a big push that this is too soon to really be doing anything. And we want to see local communities do it first. Um, and I do still really strongly hold that opinion that um, I think it would be great to see cities lead the way in Colorado um, figuring out in their city what's right for their city. Um, yeah, and you want to get into language? Um, I'm just going to um, just hop onto a point that Nicole had mentioned about, uh, you know, um, cannabis legalization and you know, who wrote the draft. And, you know, while Colorado was first to legalize cannabis, we failed at social equity. Again, if you look around at who, who owns licenses and um, even right now, there's all this money uh, going into now social equity license uh, applicants. There's now, um, you know, accelerator programs and a fund to help that, but there's still a huge struggle for people of color, for um, for anyone with a previous record or cannabis charge to enter this, you know, booming legaliz legalization um, economy that we have here in Colorado. And, you know, if you look and, and, and agree, like social equity, you know, I've heard from one of the cannabis lawyers that, you know, no, no state has gotten that right. But still, it just shows that when we rush sometimes, who's going to be, who might be left out? And um, that was definitely something that, you know, when we talk about when we were invited to be part of this process, I got an invitation to be invited in October of 2021. And which, you know, I mean, I would hope I would have been invited a little bit earlier due to being part of the team in 2019. But um, yeah, it, it's just, uh, you know, an afterthought of, of some sorts, I guess. But, um, you know, I walked into, I just want to kind of also tell the story of how these town halls went for some of the people that weren't there. You know, this was the first time we had heard about a statewide ballot initiative. So you bring a bunch of new people in the room that all have their own relationships with this medicine. You have people that have, that, that call this, you know, um, their, their ancestors, you know, this is their, this is their sacrament. And this is the first time we, we bring a bunch of people in the room to talk about what does legalization look at it? And then we hear about this, um, you know, out of state pack called New Approach. New Approach um, is also working with um, Initiative 58. New Approach is a DC out of state pack, meaning political action campaign. They were very involved with cannabis legalization throughout the nation. And they're heavily funded. Yes, they likely have some great players, but this is cannabis, you know, this is who's funding, um, you know. This is what I'm hearing for the first time, <laughs> sitting in a room with a bunch of people that I'm like, oh, they're new, oh, great to see them. And we all care about the future of something, you know, that we, especially us in 2019, we were gathering signatures in 40 degree weather. It was again, 10 degree weather. Um, and so, you know, we put in a lot of work and now we hear there's this like out of state pack coming in to tell us how, you know, pres holding this carrot, like kind of in front of us telling us like, you know about the policy so right away that i mean you can imagine a lot of people you know with the reservations one two because it you know i would love to have seen it where it was us colorado folks people you know writing this policy working together but now we are in october and we hear they're going to drop language in december or january and we're all scrambling so again like there wasn't you know as someone who's been involved since like 2018 there wasn't really a, this due process of getting people invited, getting diverse people. Like, I personally would love to see um, this different than cannabis. I don't know how this is a copy and paste where all the people with the cannabis licenses are actually now very excited about psychedelic licenses. 
And then what are we going to do with equity? And who's playing? I mean, this is indigenous medicine. And then that was a big question to me. It's like, where are the indigenous folks invited to be part of this conversation? And there is an article from Westward um, written about that a little bit um, in January. One of the first articles that dropped, and it, it was said that, you know, there weren't very many people of color in the room creating this. And that's a shame because, again, you know, these substances that we're talking about, DMT, psilocybin, psilocin, ibogaine, all indigenous medicine. And here we are. Now we've got, you know, cannabis lawyers in suits and men all behind closed doors not really inviting community. So I just want everyone to know a little bit of being in our shoes of what this was for a lot of us sitting this in, in this room, hearing that now someone from out of state is gonna come and fund it and give us, you know, and maybe we should work with them. We're all like, wait, how? You know, and, and so, and then a lot, of, a lot of questions, you know, who is funding them? Because again, we all know this now, 2022 politics in America, that you were beholden to who's funding this. And so that is something that is just, um, Something I want us to all very, you know, to think about. Um, New Approach PAC has put in $2.5 million already and counting, you know, and if you look at the record, you I like to pose the question is like, these outcomes so bad, why? Right? And again, just remember decriminalization. Who makes money off decriminalization? The people, nobody, the people. I mean, it's people power. And then now we have this huge, you know, corporation, uh, there's talks of, there's a, one of the latest articles really kind of dives into, we want to know who's funding new approach. You know, like I said, cannabis legalization back, we've got David Bronner, we've got, you know, the Dr. Bronner um, soap company. I've heard Scott's Miracle Grow. We've got, you know, just big, heavy players, you know, the rich and the wealthy coming in here, coming into Colorado, telling us how it's done. So again, right away, being grassroots, being like already looking at cannabis and being like, uh-uh, like you've killed the culture of this plant. You know, it's all corporate cannabis now. We had a 420 festival and like the 420 was a champagne toast. I mean, we used to go out there and, and rally and be together and fight for our rights because this is a plant. And so, you know, so now I'm like deja vu, I'm sitting in this room and we're talking about psychedelic legalization. We've got a group of indigenous folks being like, my family member went to jail for this, so how are they going to be able to plan this top-down model? And then you've got other people being, we want entrepreneurship. And then you've got other people being like, how are we, how is this going to be accessible for everybody? And so I just really wanted to bring you back to that time in October where I sat there and I was like, this is a mess. I even texted Katie at the Psychedel Club. I was like, you're not here. Why aren't you not here? And I was like, and it is a mess. It is a heated discussion because now we have out-of-state forces telling us you know, with this carrot, and, and I've made this mistake when you bring, um, and I want to share just one more story because, you know, I come here as um, from an equity lens. When we did the measure in 2019, I was the only woman of color sitting, you know, uh, out of the six, six people. So I constantly am, you know, the voice for equity and inclusion and diversity in this movement even. Um, and so, you know, then I was tasked with, you know, with these, and, it, and I want to give a shout out to SPORE, SPORE, the Society of Outreach Reform and Education, they hosted these town halls. So it wasn't even like new approach, it was SPORE, a nonprofit, also very concerned that this was happening, brought us all and invited other people to come and t take part in these like three town halls. So again, like I mentioned that first one, it was, it was hectic, you know, again, so many people, people feeling threatened, again, these, these are the, this is the medicine and you know, people being like, I wasn't able to participate in cannabis legalization. How is this not going to be the same thing when we go down the same route? Um, and I will have to just also say that cannabis lawyers were involved in writing Initiative 58. And so these are just reasons, you know, my intention of what sparked me to be a part of Initiative 61, which was in response to this. Again, Nicole had mentioned, a lot of us didn't jive with this whole out-of-state coming in telling us how to you know live our lives how to have our medicine here in Colorado so um so at one point we broke up into these subdivisions to be like okay who's going to be like the champion for equity one mistake never to do guys if anyone's asking you to champion equity don't put all the people of color in one group and be like you guys are going to fight for equity <laughs> thank you Red. yes that is not the way to do it we need people we need everyone to be talking about equity okay and so imagine this, I host the first equity meeting 
And it is like, I mean, you would think we would all be coming together for this, right? No. We're also now like, oh, it, like people just did no, and then we're talking about why we have to talk about um, certain policy, and people aren't even on board with. Wait, this is this is someone who uses his medicines, Los Niños, calls them their ancestors. She says to me, "These, this is transactional. You're trying to like make money off my ancestors," and I was like. Wait, 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 I'm not, but we, this, like, it was just, like, fast forward, trying to get everyone on the same page of, like, this, this out-of-state thing is coming in hot, and we have to get something together. So you can imagine, we didn't get much together. I mean, I, at one point, had to give up the whole equity co-share thing, saying, like, this is something that the whole group needs to be talking about. We're not going to give it to the, the few voices of color in the room to fight for equity as we talk about potential legalization, profiteering, tax, and regulation of what is, you know, people's ancestors and ancestral medicine and spiritual medicine and the divine itself. And so I just wanted to, um, yeah, just give you all that, of what it was like for me, you know, like what, it, what it's been like, you know, up to this far. And so, yes, Nicole asked if I would be a co-proponent um, behind Initiative 61. And, you know, <laughs> I, I agreed to it, but, you know, has raise your hand if you've ever ran a ballot initiative <laughs> okay a few people yes yeah. but like this is something you know you need thousands millions of dollars you need resources you need grassroots but again we just got out of covid we're still just trying to figure out how to socialize you know <laughs> like and get back out of the underground that we have been so just i just want to paint the picture of what it really was like for us and i knew in my mind i knew in my heart Yes, I'm, this was like without a doubt. This was a fuck yes. I'm going to I, I'm going to be a co proponent behind another initiative to just decriminalize because I believe in that. I've never faltered away from that. Um, and my so my heart said yes. My mind was like you're crazy. Like, <laughs> but you know I'm really I'm really happy we're here. I see it as you know I'm I'm here purely you know and I prayed on it. I pulled all my oracle cards and I, you know, really prayed. I slept on it and then I told Nicole, I was like, yes, I will be a co point for this. I believe in it so much. And then I spent the first month kind of in shock, like, oh my God, what did we just do? <laughs> How are we gonna fund this? How are we gonna do the rest of it? You know, getting, you know, the next steps of safe. So we've been grassroots. We, no one has paid us a cent to be here today. No one has paid, you know, thousands of dollars and giving us like all these resources to, you know, gather signatures, none of that. I just want everyone to really know that. You know, when you think of the differences between the two, no one is paying me to be here today. I'm here purely on divine and my own will and my choice. So, um, yeah, just wanted to. Uh, I'm sorry, who put it on the state? Sorry, what was that? Who put it on the state ballot? I mean, here, who put it on the state? We did. So, um, okay, so there's two, currently two initiatives that are um, potentially going to be, I'm not sure, okay, so there's two initiatives, the Natural Medicine Health Act and the Initiative 68. We are the co-proponents. No. You said 68. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Hold on. Okay, rewind. Let's, let's there are two that. initiatives currently, Initiative 58, which is the Natural Medicine Health Act, and Initiative 61, which is the initiative that we are the co-proponents on. Um, Initiative 61 was very much a reaction by community to Initiative 58. Um, in order to get onto the ballot, you have to petition and get the signatures, as you know, we all know. Um, I think, I'm not sure, I, I know that Initiative 58 has turned in their signatures. I'm not sure if they have the official yes, um, but there could potentially be two on the ballot this November. Um, and we are talking about the one that we are the co-proponents of, um, but also explaining to, you know, how that kind of ties in and relates to um, the role that community played in 58 and how we sort of responded. Right, so you want to say the community, but it sounds like it's already gone up to the state party. Yes, both of these- Which you didn't want. So I think what Melanie had just hit on really well is like the tension that happens when you put a bunch of people in a pressure cooker and talk to them. 
tell them to talk about politics in the middle of a global pandemic. Um, nobody wants to do that. Um, and a lot of people in this space were asked to do that over the last year. And that's where I found myself in that same kind of mindset that I hit on at the beginning of like realizing how easy it is to kind of give your power away in this space. I could have, I had the choice then to say, you know, I am somebody who has, you know, another related to this space nonprofit, Decriminalized Nature Boulder County. I, you know, the things that I say in this space, people listen to, we were holding regular events. Um, the decisions that we make, you know, people notice them. And so I had to make the choice, like I'm, you know, involved in these policy decisions. So am I going to show up and, you know, join the side of something that I don't align with? Am I going to walk away completely because it seems like a big mess? Or am I going to be an example of like what we think should happen given these conditions? And that's how we came to be the co-proponents of this initiative. And if that answers your question. <laughs> Awesome. So, um, so what does it look like to have an inclusive result? What does, what does that primary result that you're looking for in the inclusivity of all of the different demographics? Because money talks, right? And it usually has a tendency to transcend race. It has a tendency to flow like water and then it has a tendency to be a whole lot like a magnet attracting iron and so is with what you're doing what is a equitable result that we would see where we could say that at least we've had we've won this battle what does the win look like For me, I think the most important thing at this stage was like making sure that the story really got told um, of what was going on in this space in Colorado. And we couldn't have told that story without um, having the platform of a campaign. Um, I think that the model of going city by city first addresses a lot of equity issues if you do it right. Um, if you have a big team of people, you know, that's coming together and figuring out what's best for their local community. Um, and then that then informs your local politicians that you have a little bit more um, access to influencing, you know, outs like different than um, when you get into big like state and federal level lobbying. Um, and the other thing I think is that, you know, we can't like use the, the word equity has been so, um, you know, I don't even really know what it means anymore. I am navigating the space as a queer person, so I don't fully have body autonomy, you know, just in general. And, and so it's like, I hear the word equity get used and I'm like, well, nobody like me was ever included in that process. And so I just kind of tune it out when I hear it. Um, but the answer that I have come to is that we have to have some sort of open task force and open decision-making power over what future policy is going to look like. And we have to hold those conversations in a way that, you know, the feedback that's given and the people that are in the room and the people that are making the decisions are actually the people who are impacted by the policy that, you know, you policy change shouldn't happen without people that it's affecting being a part. Of. And that's what happens, you know, really. And then we call it equity because we added the equity person. Like that's not equity. Um, so yeah, I keep it local open task forces. Um, and have conversations, you know, it's, it's a, a slow, tedious process of including people, you know, not shoving a Google Doc in their face and saying you have 24 hours to uh, tell me what you need to tell me because we got to go because the polling looks good, you know. And then I'll add that like, um, oh. the natural medicine health act. Oh, yeah. 
to the yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And that you know, Colorado is a very politically viable place because we passed the I three hundred one here first. Um, other states where this is, you know, things like this are likely to happen, Washington, Oregon, California. Um, for people up there making that investment, you know, they're really just looking like, where's the next best place to invest? And in 2020, it was Oregon, um, and they invested in M109, um, which in my opinion has been a disaster. Um, and then in 2022, Colorado looked like the good choice. And so here we are. Um, dealing with this as a community. I would really like to um, show you guys the language Let's go through it. and show you what it does um, and show you why, you know, given the conditions that we've just explained, uh, we think this is kind of the best thing to get on the ballot, especially knowing that there could be a, you know, legal corporate market um, of these medicines soon. Um, and something that I wanted to hit on too is just like the misconceptions um, that I keep hearing, you know, like when we put all these people in a pressure cooker to talk about politics, it's easy for a lot to get misunderstood. Um, one of the things that I keep hearing is that there's like infighting in the psychedelic community or um, competing ballot initiatives. Those are two things that the media likes to say. Um, it's not a competition because you can't, like, you know, the ballot initiatives aren't candidates. They're not competing against each other. Um, we are participating in a democratic process that our state allows us to. Citizens can put something on the ballot. They can attempt to do that. I come from Texas, and you can't do that in Texas. So, um you know, we're simply just like, you know, doing something that we can do as citizens in a state where we have can have an impact on policy. Um, and everybody was asking, you know, like, well, what do people want to see? You know, if we, we are all rallied around what we don't want. So what do we want? And this is what we came up with. Um, this is what we came up with in the time frame that we had to come up with. People were like, well, couldn't you have done this and that? And it's like, yeah, maybe if we had more time, but Given that, again, we were a reaction to something that Nicole and I didn't align with and community members, this is this is what we got, you know? And what we feel like we did a good, you know, fairly good job with the time frame that we got, but it's it's really basic decriminalization. Um, so the, the first kind of thing that we had to figure out was, are we going to revise the Controlled Substances Act or are we going to create another act? Um, and we chose to go with just revising the Controlled Substances Act um, because it would have been a very simple initiative um, and it would have accomplished, you know, kind of the bare bones of what we were trying to accomplish. And it um, would have, um, oh, and, and because of that choice, we were limited in our scope of what we could do. So a lot of people have questions of like, well, why, um, you know, just deeper questions about a lot of it about, you know, regulation and, and legalization and those types of things, which are held under an act where you're, you know, directly creating a new process. We are just revising the Controlled Substances Act. So anything that we put in there just acts as a revision to an act that currently exists. Um, I don't know if this is easy for people to read, if it's big enough. I don't know how. Um, okay, cool. So, um, you can minimize the panel to the left to add the page. Yeah, right. Zero says one. You can somehow minimize that panel. And yeah, that's what I'm trying to figure out to do. I feel like. I can't figure out how to get that to go away. I feel like I'm like the teacher that all the kids are like, stop doing that. <laughs> um, just read it. It's like, uh, it is, supposedly. This isn't my computer that I use for normal stuff either, so I'm kind of, okay. Um, so it says, notwithstanding any other provision of law, the following conduct is not in violation of state law or the laws of any locality within the state 
and no contact permitted by this subsection constitutes the basis for investigation, detention, search, seizure, arrest, or other legal penalty. So we added in that other legal penalty piece after a lot of feedback the people were like, well, what about this thing? You know, what about people on probation? What about all of this? So that those three words are intended to capture any other legal penalty. Um, so the things that, you know, would no longer be the basis of detention, search, seizure, arrest, investigation is the possession, use, cultivation, production, sharing, giving away, and delivery of entheogenic plants and fungi by or between natural persons 21 years of age or older um, and entheogenic plants and fungi means psilocybin, psilocin, ibogaine, mescaline, and DMT. Um, so it also protects the provision of supervision, guidance, therapeutic, harm reduction, spiritual, or supportive services with or, re with or without remuneration by natural persons 21 years of age or older to natural persons who are engaging in the intentional and consenting use of entheogenic plants and fungi. So that intends to protect anybody who is facilitating, and it even leaves room for um, them to be able to charge for the um, facilitation, for the harm reduction, for services provided around the medicine, just not for the exchange of um, the, you know, you couldn't sell the medicines. Um, and, but um, because it's, it has to do with natural persons, um, and not corporations, you know, there's obviously a limit to how you could benefit from that little room um, of, you know, being able to, to financially support yourself based off of things you might be doing with these medicines. So it, it's really intended to support somebody who might be providing harm reduction services and charging for it, somebody who might... Um, be facilitating a journey with somebody, you know, once or twice, and um, that person that was, you know, doing the medicine felt like the person facilitating should be paid for that. It's meant to protect that, but not to protect, you know, any corporate, corporatized um, type of sale and that kind of stuff. Um, it also protects the possession of paraphernalia designed for use in the cultivation, production, storage, use of antigenic plants and fungi by a natural person 21 years of age or older. Um, and then, except as otherwise prohibited by law, um, nothing in subsection 7 of this section shall be construed or interpreted to permit a person to distribute or sell any amount of such antigenic plants and fungi for remuneration as part of a business promotion or other commercial activity. So you cannot sell the medicines. Um, you can't have a business selling them, that kind of stuff. And then it goes into effect um, 30 days after the vote um, as defined by the Colorado Constitution. So that's really it. It's short. Anybody can understand it. I think there's a big benefit to short policy a lot of the time. Um, it's not overcomplicated. It's not um, something that we're going to have to like continuously go back um, and revise and fix and catch the mistakes that we made. Um, it's something that's very simply just making things that are already occurring no longer a crime. A big point that I try to really always hit on is when we talk about equitable access, are we talking about protecting the rights of people to do what they're doing now? Or are we talking about creating a new system that is going to be at the expense of the system that currently exists? Um, and then tell people that that's the only way that they can access it and then do things like make it cheaper and call it equitable. So it's that distinction between protecting currently occurring access from legal penalty and then creating a whole new industry um, that's going to have barriers of entry. And so I think both can exist, but I think a really important thing is that we start with something that looks like this. So when I go back, going back to like saying they're not competing ballot measures, I do think that, you know, there is a way for regulation to look good, but the way that we are seeing it proposed in 2022, I didn't agree with. Um, and as somebody who works in healthcare, I didn't agree with some of the rhetoric around how mental health was being talked about. Um, so this is, what we think would be best to see in 2022. 
Um, and then hopefully we can all come to the table and, and decide on something um, that is more equitable and that is um, more in line with the intentions of affected communities um, in 2024 or at a later date. I saw a couple of hands. Um, yeah. And yeah. I, could, I can't tell us if, if there's two up. Wanted to go first, so I'm gonna let him talk. Okay. Just real quick, you say, I hear you saying you're not competing. What happens if both pass? That's what I was gonna ask. Okay. Um, so, in the areas where they conflict, um, the one with more votes would trump that one. So, it would like, if Natural Medicine Health Act got more votes in areas where they conflict, um, to our knowledge, they don't actually con conflict anywhere. They actually, um, have, you know, they interact with the Controlled Substances Act differently. So, um, yeah. And just a quick follow up. If they don't, if they don't have that interaction, if natural medicine passes, does that mean essentially you're getting everything you want out of this included? Or what's excluded if that one wins? Um, so, the, okay, yeah, I see that, what you mean. Um, but because we're advocating for decriminalization first, we don't feel that the National Medicine Health Act does that. We don't feel like it fully actually decriminalizes these medicines um, and that it has the intention to continue to hold that line of as it progresses. Um, the very same people behind it were quick to put in possession limits in California um, and then to completely, you know, not decriminalize it at all in Oregon. Um, they say that's because M110, which was the full decrim initiative, was also on the ballot that year. That's complicated Oregon politics that, you know, it does matter to Colorado, though, because we're all watching each other and learning. Um, but we've seen there's, you know, when... Um, when somebody strives to profit off of something and create an industry, people who are doing that same thing outside of the industry are a threat to that industry, especially when they're, um, you know, a lot of people are like worried about the danger of these medicines. And in the cities that have decriminalized, we haven't seen a risk to public health and safety following decriminalization. So we know that it's safe. And I always say, you know, the only, problem is that nobody's profiting and so now people with corporate interest in this space are seeing that there's room to profit room to commercialize and room to come in and do that so because they know that there is a strong grassroots movement behind decrim first they're going to try to make it look like that's what they're doing because they want the support of the people on the grassroots community so we had to make the decision. We are reading this language. They're saying it's decriminalization. Is it the decriminalization by the way we define it? Uh, and we didn't think so. So then we're like, well, how would we define it? And this is how we have defined it. Um, there are specific things in the Natural Medicine Health Act that seem to be that the intention is to add in limits. Um, and that's the big thing that we have advocated against is that nature should not be limited. We shouldn't be limited in how many cannabis plants we can grow. Um, we shouldn't be limited in how many mushrooms we can grow and that kind of thing. And it's not because, you know, we want this free for all, you know, big, like, I, like any negative thing somebody could say about that. It's because the introduction of limits and anything like that where you then give a law enforcement official, any room to arrest will be, um, you know, you're, you're essentially just giving them a key to arrest, to, to seize property, to um, harm, you know, the most marginalized communities that we know are always affected by the drug war. So we don't want to add in any room where something like that can happen. Um, and we don't think nature should be limited in people's ability to you know, grow it and cultivate it. Right, and if you look at uh, the cannabis industry, I, I don't know how many people are following uh, medical cannabis. Again, there was medical cannabis before there was adult use cannabis. And now, um, 
you know, there was the passing of House Bill 1317 in 2021, and uh, it now regulates um, the recommending practitioner for, like, over-regulates so much that this is, because of House Bill 1317, this has put, like, a nail in the coffin for medical cannabis. Um, now there's pediatric patients that can't get, a, they, they added in this rule. So, again, you know, we create legalization policy we put you know um dora in charge of the doors the department of regulatory agencies um there's been a lot about dora and and even you know how they try to um over regulate medical cannabis practitioners you know people giving recommendations and with the passing of house bill 1317 patients rights are um have been affected i know people and um uh pediatric patients that now can't find a second recommending medical cannabis doctor because of this like newly regulated law. And therefore they can't have a medical cannabis anymore. They can't find another doctor. Plus it's also very expensive to get two doctors, not only one, and also pay for all your own medicine. So I just like to like, you know, I come from that. I've seen what it's done to medical cannabis and I am very, you know, concerned about the same people behind closed doors writing that, that there's not gonna be equity and then yes, Oh, decriminalization, we'll give that to you now, but what's going to happen? They're going to want to regulate it. Because again, who makes money when all of us can grow our own food and our own medicine? Well, to answer that question, it's because in Florida they have fruit that falls off the trees, but they still sell it in the, in the grocery stores, okay? There are going to be a lot of people that are not going to want to grow their own medicine. There's going to be a lot of people who are incapable because of location or aptitude who would like to take availability of the services of those who can produce these medicines. I'm a big fan of what you're doing. I'm just saying that there's a, the reason that money has the influence that it does is because it gives people who don't have the ability to do something the opportunity to engage okay mm -hmm. so if you don't if you have a little bit of money i can i can remunerate a friend and have his or her product one of the challenges that we're looking at is that in the cannabis industry a lot of people who couldn't work in any other industry are working in the cannabis industry because they're stoners. They would have never have passed a piss test, but in the cannabis industry, they have an industry to work with. In this way of decriminalizing the psilocybin or the ethnogenic medicines, then we are creating another faction, I would suppose, that is going to shelter those people as well. And they're going to be needing to have remuneration. They're going to be needing to have comfort. They're going to be needing to have these things. And it sounds like we are really concerned about them getting these things. You know, I mean, if we're, if we're talking about big money, big changes make big money. And so if we're going to differentiate ourselves from not wanting to be the corporate taking over medical whatever, we're going to have to put up some parameters. What kind of parameters would you suggest that we put up against the corporate takeover? I mean, this is what we're looking at. I, I would love to be on the people side, but I want remuneration. I want free trade. I think that the reason that cannabis is stalling is because I can't trade with Wyoming. I can't trade with California. I can't trade with New Mexico. I can't do, I can't get their best for my best. And if it feels like we're stalling here, then I'm wondering if we're, we're giving ourselves a trap where we won't be able to expand, where we won't be trapped in Colorado. We won't be able to expand our options or opportunities. I'm, I'm on South Broadway right in the middle of the Green Mile. Most people come here and say, what are you bitching about? And, you know, you got 75 different selections in one dispensary. And then I tell them about our, our, our experiences, you know, they're breaking down the medical barriers, they're, they're, they're making it harder on patients and all of those things. And people don't care because they're able to buy their weed. And those people are being remunerated. 
You see what I'm saying? So if we put barriers around ourselves, then aren't we automatically kind of uh, going to a dead end? Are we not, are we not, I mean, if we put barriers of, of entry because they are not the appropriate demographic to, to insert themselves into the product flow stream, then aren't we just going towards a dead end? I don't see it as a dead end. I definitely hear your point. I know there's a time, and, and believe me, there's going to be corporate psychedelics. Like eventually, guys, it's coming, um, and it could be yeah, even. It's going to be yeah. It's going to be here. I mean, um, and and so for us, I mean, we always see this like decriminalization as the foundation of where everything gets built upon, whatever that is, you know. And so don't have the don't have the answers for what are you know how do we do it the right way or even you know barriers when we talk about them but i know that you know um i would love all these that your your voice you know diverse voices at the table to, to be able to create this and you know and yes you know there's going to be rulemaking um and that that's coming and, and and i definitely um still plan to be involved with rulemaking but i'm just saying that like I've always seen just decriminalization as the foundation. It's from the bottom up. It creates, you know, access for everyone. We stop criminalizing people for possession, use cultivation. We believe in a grow, get, gather, um, you know, method. Um, and that's where I truly, again, just with my history, I, that's where I believe is that we start there. And then we bring in your voice, everybody else's voice indigenous voices in the beginning, not later, not later as to, um, you know, from the very beginning. I mean, and then that's where I think we can come up with something, something else. Um, but that's, that's me and that's my opinion. And I'm just asking, you know, for everyone to just be discerning. It sounds great. Who doesn't want natural medicine in Colorado? But I'm just asking everyone to really sit and read 18 pages of fine print you know, about their policy. That's that's what I'm saying. And so again, given the time that we were, you know, given given my background in equity and seeing, you know, the same people have written legislation and where we're now in Colorado and what's happening in a regulated model with ca medical cannabis access. I'm just asking everyone to really, you know, be aware, be discerning and to really sit with it. Um, a couple, yeah, I, mean, I don't want to go too much um, about you know the other initiatives, but sure, your question, sir. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah. So if uh, initiative fifty eight passes, would that open the door to companies like Field for Health or Business or these like for profit psychedelic uh, therapy companies? Yes. Um, so right now in um, the Natural Medicine Health Act fifty eight, um, there you know how when we legalized cannabis, we left it to residency, Colorado residents. Kind of really like that. I mean, I know other states have different ways, but for Colorado, I really like that at first. And only later, we then said anyone out of state, commercial interest, you know, we opened up licensing to anyone. But um, with the National Medicine Health Act, it does any individual from out of state. I mean, European people, everyone's excited. They are ready to harp in and buy up all the land, raise all of our property. Uh, value and everything. Um, no, but they're excited. I mean, it, yeah, they're excited. So it does open it up to any individual. There is no residency requirement to answer that question. I'm sorry. Can you can you speak up and, and repeat yourself, please? Yes, I was just curious when you speak of indigenous. Are you speaking of native Coloradans and that uh, as the voice? I'm, I was curious. So I'm trying to hear this, but uh, yes, indigenous. Um, I'm I'm speaking to yes, of course. Um, indigenous um, members of Colorado, Native Americans. Um, people that have a very close relationship, you know, again, people that use this already for religious, spiritual practices, people that use this, um, you know, as their divine, you know, this is a, this is their ancestors. That's who, that's who, when I say indigenous, that's who um, I would like to be at the table writing and drafting this policy, that and people of color. Um, sure. Uh, 
Uh, do you think that having two two bills uh, could split some votes and neither one would pass? I mean, uh, is the public aware that you vote for both? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think you'll, you'll get your ballot and you'll see what's on it. And I think if you're, you know, somebody who's excited about this space and wants to see anything passed, you would probably vote yes for both. If you're paying attention to everything and asking really critical questions and considering all the moving parts, you might vote differently. Um, I. I think people generally understand that. I have been kind of frustrated just with the portrayal of it being a competition. Um, it's it's a difference in you know in strategy, and it's also a um, a difference in, in just power dynamics. Um, and because there wasn't a grassroots option on the table. And a lot of people were concerned about that. We stepped up to provide that. Um, and I think a big thing that is like coming up in these questions is questions about regulation. And when it gets posed as this thing that you know we're competing with something, um, it also kind of pigeonholes us into this um, idea that we are anti-regulation. Um, we're not. We are not in agreement with what regulation ideas currently are on the table. Um, and we really believe that given more time um, and more input from affected people, um, we could create a regulatory system that does address a lot of these things that people are concerned about. Um, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Riley. So, I know you want to figure it out as a community, like what the rules should be. But let's say you're the czar of psychedelics of Boulder or in Denver. What's the ideal way to do it? What's the ideal rule that could be put in place 10 years from now or something like that? What would you like to put So you have to get everybody into the conversation. So these policies affect people. People that are people that you know are doing things that relate to these medicines will be affected by what happens. There's organizations that um, are set up about psychedelics and about different things in Colorado, and I want to see all of those people informed about what's going on coming together to decide that. Um, as far as you know what I would personally like to see in policy at this point, I think like what we're really hitting on is that like I don't have that answer today because I think it's too soon to regulate this. Um, I think the, the reasoning people use to push for regulation, I, it doesn't make sense to me because it comes from this you know, idea that there is a mental health crisis, which there very much is. Um, but even more than that, there's a systemic crisis um, in healthcare. And if we push these medicines through something, through that same system, then all of this argument about how we're gonna end the mental health crisis with psychedelics, you know, it, it doesn't track because you're putting it into a system that's causing the issues that are perpetuating the crisis. Um, and I also think that this medicine, you know, while a lot of people do use it and report really positive effects, um, we are right at the beginning of being able to research these things. Um, and psychiatry has a notorious history of experimenting on people with medications, of making false claims about medications, um, and it also is capturing the most vulnerable client or most vulnerable patient populations. So, um, putting a very very powerful medicine into those hands, um, it doesn't seem like the right thing to do, and it is going to happen. And so, um, how can we make sure that our individual rights are protected? Is what we're really concerned with. And I see that the um, 
I, I hear people explain the proposed regulatory system as not being a medical model, um, but it's going to be decided on by healthcare providers and it's going to be um, you know, very much put through that same system. And I'm, you know, I'm also not opposed to it going through that system. I know that it is coming. It's just, how do you frame it? Um, and I don't think that the current framing that I'm seeing is always something that I feel comfortable, um, supporting. So we have time for one or two more questions. Um, you, yes. Um, so in the decriminalized financially, like, from personal experience, I know it, it takes a lot of energy and money to grow certain things, um, whether you're not a gardener or grow mushrooms in your basement, like, it takes a lot of money. And, like, so in a decriminalized um, model, in order to get access to people, how does it work if it's, like, a donation-based? Like, you give somebody tomatoes from your garden, and they want to pay you for them and, as a gift. You know, like, is it kind of the same reciprocity um, in terms of like trade or whatever one might call it? Um, not that anybody's charging anything for, and charging anyone for anybody, but it's like, you know, um, when I do free tattoos, I'm not a licensed tattoo artist. So if people want to Venmo me, they do. And if they don't have money, I do it anyway. You know, so I'm just wondering, in a decriminalized model, does that work? Is that like a good way to start with community regulation in terms of making it um, a service that people can provide to people who don't have access to growing their own goods? Yeah, so we're supporting like that a grow gather gift model, and then you're kind of asking, you know, well, what if somebody does want to pay, or what if you know those types of tricky gray areas. Uh, the intention of what we have drafted is that if you are facilitating holding space for somebody, you could charge for the work of, um, you know, sitting with them or helping them integrate their their um, experience or that kind of thing. You know, you might have somebody that already um, has something set up or, or wants to provide harm reduction services, but it's difficult to say at this point like what we what what could really be legally allowed because these are of course still um federally illegal um and so like in answering that it's important that we're also understanding that when we talk about a legal system in colorado it's still federally illegal so any licensed center in colorado is also going to run into some of the same difficulties you know, with it being federally illegal still. Um, and a big part of that that's interesting, if you look into what's happening in Oregon right now, is the issues around um, insuring places like that. Um, so that is a big issue that comes up with a really strict regulatory model is that it's like impossible to insure, which makes the work really hard to actually do. And they're also very expensive. Um, yeah. You might have heard in Oregon, um, sitting with psilocybin is costing about a thousand dollars, and uh, so yeah. Um, anyone have another question, Clayton? Yeah. So I, I sense in the conversation the desires of not great as adversarial, right? But I'm wondering how that fits into the model when Compass Pathways and other corporate actors have explicitly stated and identified Compass Pathways who seeks to privatize and own the rights to both the modality and the medicine. When somebody like Compass Pathways identifies decriminalization movements as the enemy in more meetings, how is it not adversary? Right? Like it's like I sense that in the kind of conversation, the desire not to frame it as like this side versus this side. But I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about that dynamic. Yeah, so I guess what I'm trying to hit on is that like I I think when people frame it as competing it means that both cannot happen at the same time. We are we know that um, things that we wish wouldn't happen, you know, could potentially happen, um, and we are advocating for what we want to see, which is decriminalization. You know, they have framed us as you know they're aware that what we're trying to do is inherently threatening to their 
desire to privatize and monopolize this space. Um, and we are against the, that happening. So, um, but the kind of competition that I'm trying to hit on being kind of a misconception is that, you know, one, that, that both of the initiatives can't exist together. Um, and that telling the story should sound more like that 61 was a reaction to 58, to people not agreeing with things in 58. Um, that maybe if a lot of people involved in putting together 61 had the choice, you know, we don't agree with 58, but that everybody doesn't have to have that same opinion. Um, and that we aren't, you know, asking people to fight aside in a battle, but, you know, being up here as somebody who has led a lot of this work, you know, you do kind of have to pick a side um, sometimes, but um, yeah. Um, one thing I wanted to make sure to say is that uh, Melanie was talking about some Westward articles that came out. Um, those were written by a journalist, Chris Walker. He put together a really incredible podcast about everything that's going on in Colorado. He has been um, in attendance of a lot of events doing some really in-depth journalism. Um, and that first episode of the podcast came out this week. Um, it's on CityCast Denver. Um, it's called, I can't remember um, what the actual episode is called, but if you look up CityCast Denver on wherever you get your podcasts, uh, you'd be able to find it. Um, it's called Ballad Trip. Fight for psychedelics now. Yeah, so there we go. Win the fight and the competition again. Um, um, first episode's out. I think that they're going to come out every Monday for the next three weeks. That might be completely wrong, um, but something like that. Yes, so, your question, Miss. Um, I think the 18 page bill actually says that community members cannot be paid to sit with people. So I like that yours allows remuneration. Thank you. Did you guys hear that? I thought there is no remuneration. There is on, on the other bill, you cannot get paid if, unless you're in the Right. So as a community right. member, you all right. have to do all your work for free. Okay, what's the correct answer? Your correct answer, answer is, I'm sorry, yes. yes. But that's just, just I, have, I have to interject on that, Pam. With, with 58 individuals who are not participating in the regulatory program can receive compensation for offering harm reduction, sitting, and guiding services with natural medicine. It's explicit in the measure on like page 14. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, again, just just read it, everybody. 18 pages, it's a lot to digest. Um, yes, one last question. Sorry, not to have both our questions, but <laughs> my ultimate goal in this cause is universal access. Okay. It seems to me that if one includes a science, traditional scientific model with an underground component and yours is purely underground. How do you believe yours achieves universal access to this medicine faster? We aren't rushing. Yeah, that's it, we're not rushing. Um, I just, yeah, let's, let's also remember, yeah, we're not rushing. Um, and, you know, this is all out there for, for us to definitely still be involved in. I hope everyone that's still here is gonna be involved as this process goes along. Um, I will say, 61, we're trying to, still trying to get on the ballot. We don't have $2.5 million coming from out of state, paying canvassers $25 to get on the ballot. It's a purely grassroots effort. Um, and we will also be organizing for 2024. This is a lesson here. So that's, you know, to your question, sir, like if it's not for, you know, and 58 has turned in all their signatures. so. Um, there's a chance 61 not, might not be on the ballot. And again, I'm, as a co-proponent behind that, I knew that going in, that again, how, who's gonna fund this? You know, decriminalization, is it sexy? Is it, you know, is it appealing to investors? No. Um, so, and I knew that going in, but to have organic grassroots dialogue, that's what got me here in the first place. You know, it wasn't, you know, um, a, you know, um, 
money or, or any of that. It was just, let's talk about psychedelics. Let's talk about why no one should go to jail for these. Let's share stories. Let's create community. Let's find other people that are like-minded in this space. And so, um, yeah, I just wanted to just to add that, that, you know, August 8th is the deadline to turn in over 125,000 signatures. And that was always a, a hard uphill battle for for me, for us, for everyone in this room that's out there gathering signatures um, in their respective markets and, and day to day. Um, but I do it because it's it's still exciting. It's still exciting for me to have a dialogue. Why are there two initiatives? And you know, after a while, 61 may or may not be relevant anymore when we get to November. But there was still a chance where some community advocates, you know, fought for what they believed in. And I feel now with you know our rights and, and our sovereignty over our bodies, you know, we need to wake up and we need to get involved and we need to, you know, be mindful of new industries that we're creating that's only going to serve a certain you know, type of person that can participate in that. And that's what keeps me going. That's why I'm still here. And I hope, you know, to continue the conversation. Um, and I really hope that I'll also make one last plug. Um, October 1st, the NOAC Society is putting on Emergence. Um, so that is an event I, I really want you to save the date on. Emergence is the first psychedelic educational festival. It'll be in Rhino, 12 to 5 p.m. And it is all ages. And it, there's no, um, it's completely accessible. It's at Real Works, which used to be the Exo Center. So again, you know, Denver is a prime spot for this. And I feel like, you know, definitely take a moment and, you know, meet each other and, you know, be in this community and, you know, just be discerning as to what happens as we continue on, you know, this ballot trip. <laughs> Thank you. 